Welcome to the British Chamber of Commerce Singapore's podcast channel. We're excited to bring you season three of new episodes featuring in-depth content across Singapore, ASEAN and the United Kingdom. We've had some extraordinary guests on our channel, including Formula One's Claire Williams. I'm a firm believer that any great team, any successful team has a great culture flowing through it. You aren't successful if you don't. So we put a lot of work into this. Renowned mountaineer Kenton Cool. That 2019 there with a client, a big storm came in and literally destroyed Camp 2. And I've got some video footage of Sherpas like trying to hold on to the tent fabric as it blows away. And... The Royal Navy's Commodore Steve Morehouse, commander of the UK Carrier Strike Group. The squadron of F-35 aircraft we have on board is a Royal Air Force squadron. And, and the personnel on there are drawn from both the Navy and the Air Force. So it's a what better way of, of showing just the efficiency and the joined up nature that we now have and distinguished Sky News anchor, Jeremy Thompson. We had two little vans with satellite links and we let, we leapfrogged up the road to Pristina, the capital, uh, throughout that first day with non-stop coverage from basically inside a war zone. We also sit down with the likes of TikTok, Twitch and Twitter and continue to bring you conversations around business and trade, leadership and people, sustainability, sports and arts and much, much more. Thank you, as always, for your support, and we hope you enjoy this podcast. Hello, and welcome to the latest edition of the British Chamber of Commerce Singapore's uh, podcast channel. My name is David Kelly, and I'm the Executive Director here at the Chamber. Today's podcast is all about hiring and expansion opportunities and advice for Singapore companies in the United Kingdom and Europe. Today, our guest is Nick Adams. He's the Vice President of Sales EMEA at Globalization Partners. Globalization Partners, of course, are our um, champions of our future of work theme. So a huge thank you to them. Nick, it's great to have you with us today. We've got some really interesting areas to discuss to support companies based in Singapore that are are looking west. Um, Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, David. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, Really looking forward to getting into the meat of the conversation today. Um, I think, you know, now more than ever, um, you know, discussion around recruiting globally, expanding into different regions, you know, it's never been more of a hot topic, especially since uh, coming out of um, pandemic and, you know, remote work and all the opportunities that uh, present itself. So thank you for having me today. No, really good. And, you know, before we start drilling down into the UK and Europe, I mean, how much have you seen change in terms of so that post-COVID shift to looking at the global talent pool, looking at where companies are starting to put their put their talent. Have you have you have you seen a big shift in terms of the way that companies have been thinking in terms of um, sort of that piece to their to their operational um, delivery? So it's it's been pretty amazing seeing how companies have adapted. So maybe maybe go back to you know early days of pandemic and lockdown, and you know a lot of businesses really were uncertain about their future you know some of them didn't think they had a a future um i call it the great experiment um where Mm. you know businesses suddenly had to um operate with their staff remote and a lot of businesses were not set up for that i think some sectors like tech you know of course were probably ahead of the curve but it went from a very pessimistic mood you know globally across all businesses about the future and, and how they were going to operate and what that meant but actually, the interesting thing was, um, you know, for, for, for many anyway, um, you know, companies thrived. They, they, they managed to have their staff uh, performing at the same level or even better remotely. And I think there's a number of reasons for that, which we, we could go into. Um, but, you know, really, companies found that they could survive with having their workforce dispersed remotely and operating from home, um, using Zoom and other tools of, of that nature. Um, and I think, you know, what that did is it gave um, companies uh, a confidence that actually as a business model, it would work for them. And I think we're seeing that in the stats these days where um, two thirds of companies are offering either hybrid working or full remote working. Um, and that of course means there is so much opportunity to hire talent wherever that talent lies, where the best talent lies globally. Um, and, and companies are really embracing that. 
Oh, that's uh, super. So uh, and let, let's start with the UK, shall we? I mean, what, what are the industries that are driving growth? Where, where are you seeing the talent available in the UK for companies that are, are looking west to, to think about where their, their future talent pool is going to come from? So um, just, just one point on the UK, which is <clears throat> right now we're in a very unusual position where there's more open jobs in the UK than there are unemployed people. Um, so roughly 1.3 million uh, open roles at this moment in time compared to around 800,000 pre-pandemic. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of movements as well. So one in five UK workers are considering changing their jobs within the next 12 months. Uh, and that's according to uh, a new PwC report. So I think the first thing is, you know, we have a, a, a lot of demand for workers in the UK. Um, there's a lot of movement. And, and again, that's you know driven, I think, you know, people coming out of the pandemic, people wanting remote work. Um, so there's a great jobs market here at this moment in time. So what are some of the industries? Well, I think, you know, tech is, it, 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 for me, certainly, probably the most exciting area. Uh, we have an amazing tech scene in the UK. We have great um, educational institutes, which um, are, are spitting out, you know, graduates of a very high quality. So within tech itself, um, you know, ed tech is, is certainly a very uh, robust and growing area, prop tech, uh, fintech, you know, UK leads uh, in fintech, probably globally, probably number one hub in the world. Um, services as a whole, um, you know, that's very buoyant as well. We see massive investment in all of these areas. So if you look at uh, both private equity and venture capital funding um, across um, the services industry, across the tech industry, um, you know, UK has never had so much funding um, as, as we have at this point in time. So, you know, a lot of businesses growing, um, a lot of businesses looking for great talent. Are you seeing sort of a bit of a talent fight in terms of, you know, those those sectors are really, really exciting. There is a great tech scene, as you've mentioned, the education system sort of set up to, to think about future skills as well. Are you seeing sort of companies having to sort of fight for the, for the best talent in, in the UK? Uh, we, we are. Um, I think if you're a UK company and you're looking to hire within the UK, then, you, you know, there are a lot of um, downward pressures such as salaries. Um, cost of living has increased and that's not just here in the UK it is a global trend but mm. many reasons for that but what we are finding is a lot a lot of the workers in the UK are looking for um, you know, more than they're being paid by um, by UK PLCs um, we are seeing um, again you know a lot of individuals who don't want to go into the office anymore um, you know without naming names uh, you know one recent um, large UK business mandated that they they want their workers to come into the office for at least three days a week and you know if you compare that with a, an employer who's willing to pay the same uh, and say you can work completely remotely um, you know, certainly for the younger generation you know that really appeals it's a much higher standard of living being able to work from home not have to commute every day so there is a war for talent as it's um, as it's been termed for many years but I think you know what is interesting is if you're having a look at companies that are willing to look outside. Um, so, you know, a Singaporean company looking to hire in the UK, as an example, or a UK company looking to hire elsewhere. You know, that's where we're finding there isn't such a, a war for talent because you have much greater, deeper talent pools. Sure. And, and sort of sort of post, post Brexit as well, I guess, and also sort of post COVID, are there, there is an acceleration, isn't there, in terms of sort of tech-led growth? Um, you know, and there's a number of organisations, um, uh, Tech UK, for example, Innovate UK, all trying to sort of sort of push this agenda. Sort of, what are what are some of the things that are sort of really driving um, sort of the the, the, skill, the skills piece that, that that global companies can tap into? Um, so, as we mentioned already, we have a you know a very highly educated workforce here. Um, I think what you you are finding is a lot of individuals want to be reskilled as well. Um, again, opportunities to you know remote work. So, if you're looking at um, somebody who's currently based, let's say in the West Country, um, they probably would never have considered you know working in fintech before because there probably weren't a lot of fintech opportunities in somewhere like Cornwall. Um, this new you know, way of working where we don't have to be physically located ne next to bricks and mortar I mean that individuals are now thinking you know, much more widely about what they want to do um, and getting retrained in some situations um, and just open for you know, a, a variety of roles, whereas previously they probably you know, 
will much more focus on only one or two things. As you say, there's a you know a lot of funding that is going into things like reskilling, um, you know, uh, additional educational opportunities. Um, so that could be you know, um, for example, you know, adult education. Um, it could be night school. There's just a ton of ways that we're seeing individuals are are really grasping that opportunity to to try something new and to pivot. And is that is that making it attractive for companies looking at talent in the UK? I mean, uh, there's things like the apprenticeship levy, isn't there? There's digital skills tax credits available. There's there's a significant increase in sort of R and D and innovation funding from the UK. That must make it at a, an attractive place for for companies all over the world to to look at the UK and start tapping into that knowledge base. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, R and D I think is a great um, great area. So there. You know, plenty of schemes that um, the UK uh, government have put in place for companies um, to hire workers into their R&D functions um, and then to effectively you know, get credits for that. Um, so if you are looking to build out um, your R&D team, um, you, know, you, you can actually find that it could potentially be as much as cost neutral in doing that if you're hiring in the UK. Um, and there's some great organisations that we uh, here at Globalization Partners, we collaborate with who can help to do that. Um, so I would suggest if anybody is interested, you know, uh, in finding out more about that, I'm sure they can come to you. But you know, likewise, they can come to us, and we can put them in touch with um, great organisations who can help with that R and D credit scheme. Super. And we, as a, a chamber here in Singapore, we we sort of um, we sort of sit under and sort of work collaboratively collaboratively with the, the, the SG UK partnership for the future and, and, and tech's a big part of that. Um, what synergies can be found for talent-based growth for companies between the UK and Singapore? Where, where, where are you seeing sort of that, that link between the UK and Singapore? So I think, you know, that there are many similarities between the UK and Singapore, you know, in terms of, you know, our strong economies, um, in terms of our work ethics, um, you know, the, the cultures, um, you know, certainly you know, there's a great resonance for individuals, you know, if they're from the UK working in Singapore or vice versa. Um, so I think, you know, we're very aligned is, is what I'm saying. You know, there, there, there is a, a great um, um, appreciation from workers who get to, um, to have the opportunity to, to, to come across and uh, either uh, work as an expat or, you know, potentially um, become employed by a company that is based in Singapore and, and maybe, you know, get the advantage of being able to um, work with that business um, and go out and meet them. Um, I think, you know, there's, there are a lot of schemes that have been put in place, the global business uh, mobility visas, um, which is uh, replacing the intra-company transfer routes. Um, we, there is um, the BritCham uh, Singapore Globalization Partners Manpower Survey that showed that 84% of survey companies are actively recruiting within the next six months. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a, I think, a lot of opportunity, and especially when we look at tech, um, Again, I think, you know, looking at the similarities between Singapore and London, um, you know, the types of roles, the jobs, the aspirations, and most importantly, the culture, you know, cultures is such a big thing. And, you know, going back to what drives workers, you know, it's salaries, absolutely, but probably as important as salaries is that culture piece and people really want to feel valued. Um, they want to have a great uh, work environment and they you know, really want to be engaged. And I think, you know, we see that a lot uh, when we look at, uh, you know, the, the similarity between uh, Singapore and UK. And Nick, there are some opportunities for companies here in Singapore to tap into, you know, a, a wider talent pool outside of the UK. Can, can you perhaps sort of share with our listeners some of the emerging talent hubs across Europe that Singapore based companies can tap into? Yeah, we've done a, we've done a lot of research on uh, different talent hubs. Uh, if you're looking at Europe specifically, um, uh, again, you know, tech and, and IT skills um, that is um, predominant in a number of locations. So Poland, uh, Poland has has for a long time been a very stable, uh, very secure um, economy um, with. Um, a very highly educated workforce, especially in Krakow, if you're looking at IT. Um, you know, there are 450 million people employed within IT within Poland. And uh, sorry, uh, 4.5 million. Sorry, uh, you have to edit that bit, Helen. My, my information says 450 million. Um, but uh, if we're looking at um, 
you know, per Poland as a whole, uh, Warsaw probably a slightly bigger base, and you know, there's a wider talent pool there. But if you're looking predominantly for for IT skills, um, you know, Krakow has a fantastic number of educational institutions. You know, spitting out um, you know some great um, graduates there. Berlin um, would be another hub. Um, you know, they have a great um, tech startup scene, a lot of incubators, accelerators. Um, so for you know companies that are in early stages, they're startups, they're looking to grow to scale ups. Um, you know, absolutely. Uh, you know, we would suggest uh, look at Germany. Um, Hamburg is a gaming center. Frankfurt is a fintech center, obviously, because you know Hamburg, uh, um, Frankfurt being the the home of um, the European Central Bank and the Frankfurt mm -hmm. Stock Exchange. Um, and then there is also um, a lot of interest around Estonia, especially around their e-residency, um, which would allow um, entrepreneurs to be able to launch a, uh, a remote business uh, based in Estonia and then utilize a lot of their services around company formation, banking, taxation. Um, so we expect to see a lot more of this e-residency idea, um, especially as we move towards this digital nomad type of work where you know individuals ultimately would like to be able to work yeah, work you know from different locations I would I don't want to say anywhere because that's probably misleading but you know this idea that you can actually be mobile and you can work from different locations and um, you can get paid at you know, different frequencies and work for different employers and really be that digital nomad and I think we are beginning to see legislation um, across different countries lighten up to allow um, that type of worker and Estonia is probably leading the way in that regard. Outside of Europe, um, you know, lots and lots of great talent hubs as well. Um, so Sri Lanka, you know, what a fantastic place for accountants. And I don't think many people know this, but uh, some of the you know biggest um, banks and insurance companies in the world have huge uh, workforces in Sri Lanka because they they have highly educated accounting graduates on uh, what are comparatively very low salaries. Um, so there's many many different places in the world that uh, you can find excellent uh, candidates um you know and potentially it could be at a much um, more cost effective rate than than employing them uh, somewhere such as uh, uh, you know new york um or or, or or a similar nick if if, if if i'm an organization looking at that sort of the global talent pool and you know spotting where great talent might be around the world you've, you've highlighted some great examples there um are there some sort of cultural onboarding challenges that i might have to face as an organization how 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 do companies through um, your network sort of help on board those that have got different cultural backgrounds to fit with uh, with a company that might have a, a, have, a, have, a have a different type of um, sort of operational base or a different type of cultural sort of nuance to it you know are, are those challenges that companies are sort of facing um so i would say you know absolutely when it comes to employing workers um, from different parts of the world you know there's so much to take into account um, there's the obvious things like language um, you know trying to employ people who do have a basic understanding of english it's probably not their first language um then uh you know time zones as well you need to be um you know cognizant that a lot of workers you know they won't work the same um hours as as for example you know somebody you know based in boston or in in london um so i think you have to you know a lot of empathy is required from the employer um, if you're having team calls, you have to make sure that you can accommodate other time zones, um, occasionally at least. Um, uh, I think, you know, what we find works very well is a buddying approach as well. So if you are hiring workers uh, who are not, you know, domestic and local to you, um, you know, give them the opportunity to have a sounding board, to have a peer that they can talk to and they can feedback. And I think that's the important thing is, uh, you know, really having a finger on the pulse and, and being able to, um, to very quickly identify um, how a new work is getting on. Um, so, you know, again, being cognizant, being empathetic, you know, making sure that you're listening to the workers. But at the end of the day, cultural diversity is such a great ingredient for success of a business. Um, the more diversity you have within the business, the better. It gives you a much more global view of the world. It allows you to do business in so many more regions and languages if you understand their customs. Um, so it's you know absolutely something that we, for example, at Globalization Partners uh, have found um, is key to the success that we've had to date, which is you know really being able to represent ourselves around the world um, and to have understanding you know when we're talking to customers wherever they're based. 
And, and Nick, over the, over the last couple of years, we've, we've almost seen sort of the world deglobalize through, you know, uh, you know the, the pandemic sort of keeping people at home or, you know, people people returning back to their, to their homelands. Um, and within that, we've seen some geopolitical sort of shifts as well over the last couple of years. Are, are those sort of considerations that companies really need to sort of look into before they start thinking about where their global talent is going to come from? Uh, so, you know, I, I think first off, we have seen a lot of companies where they have had part of their workforce uh, go back to their home country you know, during the pandemic, as an example. Mm -hmm. um, so some companies have really been drawn, whether they've liked it or not, into you know, making that decision. You know, do they hire workers in, in different countries and locations where they haven't previously? Um, I, the, the, the big issue is if you are an employer and you uh, have workers in countries that outside of your usual remit, um, you really have to understand what you're getting into in terms of, um, you know, employment legislation, um, in terms of taxes. Um, and it's actually very difficult um, to do that, especially if you're a small business, um, you know, opening in a new market or employing in a new market um, is, is a huge undertaking. Um, there's the, uh, you know, the initial steps of having to, um, you know, register uh, an entity and, and to find accountants and lawyers and draft employment contracts. Um, but when you've gone through all of that, you know, you have to pay the individual, you have to ensure you're providing those statutory um, benefits, uh, such as, you know, pensions as an example of what we have here in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, you have to make sure they're fully tax compliant. Um, and But you know, just as importantly, you have to absolutely be compliant with HR legislation. So when you're looking at things like maternity or paternity or, or paid time off, you know, all of these types of things, and it's incredibly difficult. And if you're looking at more than one country, then obviously that just multiplies. So um, that's an area we can help businesses with. Um, you know, we, we, we have our own entities in place in 187 countries. Um, we can actually hire uh, the customers, workers, wherever they are, uh, and we can make sure that they're employed compliantly and that taxes are, are treated as they as they need to be. And we assume all of the risk on on, uh, on behalf of the customer. Um, so I would say that, you know, the great thing with um, this new way of working is it's a lot easier now um, to employ people wherever they are. And, and it can be done very quickly. And, uh, you know, a great example of where, you know, that could be important is if you have a competitor and there's a, a great team member of theirs who wants to come across and work for you, um, but they happen to be based somewhere else in the world, you don't have an entity there, then you do want a mechanism where you can you can hire them quickly and compliantly. Um, so, uh, you know, certainly areas that we can assist with. So what, what, what preliminary advice would you give to companies looking to find their first hires in either the UK or the European region? There's many ways to approach a market. Um, absolutely need to do your, your, your research. Um, you need to make sure, firstly, that you know, there is a valid um, business model for you in, in the country. So um, you know, no matter where it is, you, know, you need to have a look at the competitive market, have a look at um, what you know, the costs of employing people. Um, have a look at uh, the government schemes, and you know, you, the UK government you know, does have some fantastic um, uh, opportunities to, to help businesses to open up uh, here in the UK. Um, there are uh, ways you can test a market. Um, so you know, you could, for example, look at uh, having a, a partner in country, uh, so effectively a, a distributor. Um, and I think, you know, ask your own network. That's incredibly important. You know, with things like LinkedIn today, we all have these great global networks. So, you know, tap into your community, try and uh, find people who, um, you know, have done it before or they know someone who's local and they can give you that knowledge. And if you can, hire within your network. That would be one of my biggest um, bits of advice. So here at uh, Globalization Partners, we've increased our headcount organically over the last uh, 26 months from 200 to 1100. Obviously that's an incredible incredible amount of hiring we've done all around the world. Um, and I, you know, I take pride, you know, in that I have a fantastic team that we've hired and a lot of that has been through, you know, our own network. Um, maybe not people who I know, you know, as a direct connection, but through, you know, second degrees or third degrees. So cannot, um, 
emphasize enough the uh, the benefit and the importance of tapping into your network um, but I think you know once you've done your research uh, once you know how you want to open to that market and you know what opportunities are available for you then I would say embrace it um, a lot of businesses may decide to send across a founder or a c-suite uh, who can go and, and make sure that you know they they can uh, articulate um, the, the DNA of, of the business and make sure that you know your culture is represented and you can hire like-minded people um that's certainly an option um or you could find someone locally you know who can give you you know that that cultural um acceleration you know somebody who does understand uh, local customs and speaks the language and, and has their own network as well so many different routes and lots of things to think about there but undoubtedly you know it's it's important that the first time that you expand or that you open a new location um, that you get it right. It's very, very difficult to come back and do it a second time. So, you know, pre preparation is key. By the beginning, Nick, we were talking about sort of uh, what industries were driving growth. And we sort of talked about the fabulous tech sector in the UK. But can you put some flavour on to, you know, why should Singapore based companies look towards the UK? Yeah, um, again, I think, you know, very culturally aligned, um, similar in terms of, you know, the quality of, um, workers when you're looking at their educational um, capabilities, you know, what have they done, their experience and their, uh, their ability to, um, you know, quickly pick up the reins and, and be productive. Um, I think the UK, um, you know, the very nature of, you know, people in the UK, we, we, we tend to be, you know, hard workers, very loyal to organisations, as long as, again, you know, you are appreciated and uh, mm. there is that engagement. Um, I think, you know, there's, there's probably not, too much difference in in the in the salaries between uh, UK and Singapore. So rather than hire someone uh, in Singapore, you know, consider you know hiring that worker in the UK. It gives you access to you know a lot of new businesses, um, and um, you know we are on uh, we do have parity uh, with the EU when it comes to lots of you know different schemes of, and ways of doing business. So you know I would say you know you could look at the UK as as a great springboard to to trade um across the eu but also um, across the americas as well um and uh you know great connections between people in the uk and the us so you know opening up here does give you that access into the us market super and there's some, there's some great initiatives between singapore and the uk as well aren't there i mean the recent free trade agreement that was signed the digital economy agreement and there's, there's, some, there's some really good platforms for companies to be able to utilize i'm sure in terms of sort of really strengthening that bridge between both countries yeah, absolutely. And we're very excited with the CPTPP, which is the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, we're hope, hoping that that um, comes into effect uh, by the end of the year. Um, and, you know, that will you know, produce, you know, effectively a, a single market, you know, so companies in Singapore uh, and the UK, you know, they can they can trade seamlessly. Um, I think it's going to be a huge shift. And what's really important is if you can get in, get in early on that and, and set up in advance, then uh, you'll be one of the ones who gets the benefits, you know, straight out from the start. Super. And outside of the UK, how can Singapore based companies looking toward Europe set up shop quickly and compliantly? Uh, yeah, very much along the similar lines as before. So, you know, do your homework, um, have a look at local companies. Um, you know, if you're acquisitive, you may find a business that you can, you can, you know, snap up and, and that gives you um, customers. Um, you have some, you know, workers initially as well. So, you know, that's one way to do it. Um, there may be um, government uh, initiatives that will, again can help you to set up and, and can help bear the cost of that. Um, talk to people uh, within your network who are on the ground um, and look to partner with um, either similar minded businesses or certainly some trade organisations that would help represent you in the region. Um, Nick, this has been a really, really fabulous conversation. I think, I think you know, quite pertinent, as we said right at the beginning. Um, have you got any sort of final sort of takeaway tips for businesses that are, that are listening today? Um, well, I would certainly say, you know, UK has a, a massive um, workers who are, you know, currently interested in new opportunities. Um, I think it's a, a thriving market. Um, again, there's, you know, never been so much investment as, as now. Um, I think there is a great confidence um, in, in the market from workers that are, you know, eager to try something new. Um, so, you know, it's a good time. I think if you're ever looking to um, get involved in the UK and, and expand here, um, open a business, um, you know, now is the time to strike. 
Super. Nick, look, thanks so much indeed. It's been, been great to have you with us today. I think some really brilliant advice and some great opportunities for companies that are thinking globally around where their talent pool is going to come from uh, and, and some, some, some fantastic insights there. Thanks so much for joining us. Wonderful. Thank you so much, David. Appreciate it. Um, Nick, I've got a couple of other questions for you that have just sort of come up that I didn't want to put into the main body just in case it was going to drop, it was going to drop you in it. Um, the first bit is, and I'm not sure how to phrase this, but Singapore's new compass framework that is tightening up the amount of foreign talent that you can bring into the country is having a dramatic effect on small businesses. So we're starting to see that play through now where, you know, to employ a foreigner or somebody, certainly somebody on an S pass, for example, here in Singapore, this might be too local for you to be able to answer if you're based in the UK. So it might be one for Charlie for another, another event, but um, you need a certain amount of Singaporeans in your organization to be able to employ that foreign talent because it's all about building the Singaporean core. And what they're doing with this framework is they've sort of mapped out the top third percentile of, of earners, local earners, and then they're mapping that with the foreign talent to be able to, to level up and to make sure the Singaporean core is being developed as well, which, which, which looks quite smart. And it's a transparent framework as well for businesses to be able to plan in the future. But I think what's been coming out of things like the Committee of Supply um, earlier this year, where you know, some of the questions were pointed towards the government in terms of I'm not able to bring that talent in because I just can't find them here. Um, it feels like you've got a model which sort of helps against that, where companies can still remain rooted in Singapore where their regional HQ is, but actually there's an opportunity for them to think about talent outside where they don't need to be sort of customer facing and they can do that remotely. It, it feels like it's, it's actually quite a good time to sort of strike and help those smaller businesses that might be struggling. Yeah, uh, so we see this quite a lot. Um, I'll give you an example of a, a you know a recent um, client we worked with. They they're actually a uh, Silicon Valley, uh, so Californian based tech firm. Um, you know, Series Series D, uh, lots of money, a big name, and they needed to uh, replace their chief marketing officer now. You know, they they would have previously looked at employing somebody you know who was certainly within the same uh, state, so some somewhere within California. Um, but you know, due to in their case, you know, very high salaries, um, they they decided to take a bit of a gamble and actually find someone who could do the role, someone who was you know an absolute A player, but maybe in a jurisdiction where A it would. Uh, it wasn't just for cost, you know, it would be a little bit more cost effective, but B, it would give them some representation, you know, globally where they didn't really have many people already. So they actually ended up finding someone in London, uh, a very similar um, business in London, found somebody who was a CFO in Cape Town. So what we are seeing is we're seeing businesses becoming really mindful of the fact that they can hire great people all across the world and they could be anywhere and actually it doesn't matter for the business you know where that person is located because through this employer of record model um you know it's it's so easy to hire somebody anywhere in the world wherever they are so i think you know for your example there of singapore um i think that's a great one you know a company in singapore looking for someone who's very highly skilled and maybe you know they don't find that person in their own market or they can't you know bring somebody in physically to work in singapore they can find an individual elsewhere and they can very quickly and compliantly employ them and it does give them a lot more than just having that worker on board again it gives them representation in other markets um, it gives them that cultural diversity um, so there's a number of reasons to to do it and, and we, we do see customers um employing in this manner because there's the confidence to do so now with remote work being as accepted as it is yeah, the other two questions i've got for you and that is that is really interesting the other two questions i've got for you are um it's just suddenly dawned on me and it, I, I probably should have been aware of well i i was aware of this but it's, it's sort of sort of really sort of concreted to me at the moment that for any small business that's looking to operate overseas where asia's very far across the world um, it is a little bit risky we've come out of brexit we're coming out of covid we've been trying to put you know food on the table for our families keeping all those small businesses going keeping our trading relations with with the eu you know keeping a lot, a lot of businesses have been struggling with that and um, it feels like you've got a model which is is pretty smart in terms of de-risking the cost of setting up 
an organization in Singapore, especially after COVID, where actually going into an office, having a name above the door is not necessarily a, a requirement anymore. And actually using your service is a good way that smaller businesses in the UK can think about that international expansion into the gateway to Southeast Asia through Singapore, because everything's sort of aligning. Is, 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 is that fair to say? So there's a number of reasons why companies would use globalization partners and, and, and our employer record model. Um, and, you know, certainly one of them is the fact that it is quicker and easier, but also cheaper than setting up your own entity. Um, it, you know, it can take, depending on where you're looking to set up, but it can easily take up to 24 months really to get to that stage where you're ready to hire locally. You have your entity, um, you know, you have, you've got bank accounts open. Um, so, you know, this model is a much quicker way to do that and it's you know the converse of you know setting up which is you know if the market doesn't work for you if you don't have an entity there if you're using this model you know you literally make last payroll and you're out so there's a huge attraction for companies that are looking to test new markets because there's much less risk and it's much easier for them to to you know to retreat if they need to and obviously you know we're not not expecting companies you know to, to to not be successful in markets but the reality is if you are you know testing new markets out you never really know until you get there and you start trading exactly how successful you're going to be and under our model what we find is rather than just maybe try one market a lot of companies are trying two or three or four new markets yeah. all at the same time and then you know the ones that are working best for them they they, they stick with um and you know this model is more cost effective until you really get to um, a certain size of business, and that could be number of workers, it could be earnings, um, and at that stage they would look to then you know move away from um, using this this type of model. They would then want to set up an entity and stand on their own feet. They'd need to anyway due to permanent establishment. So you know they need to um, they need to really be um, more compliant with local tax and, and actually um, you know not not siphon profits out of of the countries. Um, so um, many reasons to it, but cost is, is definitely one. No, that's really good to hear, because obviously as a Chamber of Commerce, we, we want businesses to set up here. We want businesses to create jobs for the local community, uh, you know, the local market here. So that's, that's, that's really good to hear about that, that journey. And my final question for you is, is there a bit of tug of war around ESG and responsibility? Because sort of Singapore's not really been a low labour cost market. And um, when you look at other countries in the ASEAN region, is there a, is there a sort of a moral tug of war between sort of the the cost of talent and paying people correctly are you see are you seeing that within your your organizations and you might not want to answer that um, and we might not want to put that in the podcast but i just i just thought i'd ask in terms of thinking where singapore is going about responsible pay payments or responsible salaries um to within that leveling up agenda are you, are you finding companies having that conversation with you guys yeah it's a great question i probably don't have you know a ton of anecdotal evidence to to answer that with um, you know, we when we talk to customers, for example, you know, a UK or a US-based organization that are looking to expand um, into Southeast Asia, um, you know, Singapore is expensive, yes, and it does have that um, it does have that appearance of being you know quite a costly place to set up. But mm. you know, I think the you know it's undoubtedly you know such a, a great bastion of good governance. Um, and, and businesses know that, um, you know, having a base in Singapore, you know, really gives them that prestige. Um, so I think they are happy to, you know, to pay fairly and to pay more. And they do understand that, you know, it's probably is going to be slightly costlier than costlier than moving into some of the other um, um, Asian, you know, um, countries. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there is just something about Singapore, which is, uh, you know, um, it, 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 it's, it's just, you know, illustrious and it's um, a beautiful, dignified, wonderful place to be. And uh, it's aspirational for a lot of businesses, I think. Yeah, it's, it's sort of balancing that social socialism versus capitalism sort of needle, isn't it? It's sort of driving a business growth, making your business successful, then being able to pay people correctly versus paying people responsibly, I guess, in a funny sort of way without phrasing that hell and don't use that um obviously because that's not what, quite what i mean but there is a balance that as a business owner as an entrepreneur you do have to try and and reduce your costs right i mean that's that's the way you drive good business growth with, with the right talent of course but you do look outside certain markets to be able to make sure that you're you're growing in that market with the cultural alliances etc um but there is I, I think there is that needle that companies are probably going to have to start thinking about in terms of is this ethical in terms of the way that i'm growing my business in certainly in other parts of the southeast asian market 
Yeah, I, 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 total, uh, totally right. So fiscal you know, responsibility, making sure that you are um, you know, paying what you should, but also not just growing in areas that are you know, very low salaries. Um, I, yeah. I, I, I think what we see is a fairly good spread where businesses, um, you know, they try to get good representation across the board. Uh, you know, so certainly we work with a, a, a large number of uh, unicorns and quadricorns and you know, all these growing businesses. And what we are seeing is rather than just aim for one market and growing in that one market, using this model does mean that they can very quickly and effectively spread their workforce across a whole region, get yeah. that cultural diversity, yeah. um, ensure that they can be locally represent, be represented as much as possible. So we are seeing that shift to, you know, scattering your workforce rather than just sort of building up uh, centres, which I, th I think is an old way of working from what we've seen. I thought that was really insightful. Thank you. Thank you for tuning into this episode of the British Chambers podcast. Before you go, don't forget to subscribe and why not leave us a rating and review on Spotify, Apple, Google and the other podcast platforms. For more information, please visit our website at www.britcham.org.sg and tune in next time for a brand new episode.